So good morning and good afternoon to those of you on the other side of the Atlantic. Welcome everyone to today's event, one in a year long series celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Department of Black Studies at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. This is an incredible milestone and one that we should all be celebrating. We've begun every event this year by paying homage to the students who demanded, protested and fought for change at this university. On November 10th, 1969, 54 black UNO students were arrested for staging a sit-in in the president's office because of his repeated failure to address their concerns regarding racial discrimination and cultural relevance on this campus. The arrest of the Omaha 54, as they became known, mobilized Omaha's black civic and social organizations and churches who worked together to bail out all 54 students and support them in their demands with the administration. One of their demands was the creation of a Department of Black Studies. And in the fall of 1971, that demand became a reality, opening the door and paving the way for other minority and, and marginalized populations of students to receive academic space and cultural recognition. It is because of the vision and the sacrifice of the Omaha 54 and the support of the Black community in Omaha that this department exists and it is because of their continued support that this department continues to exist. Two days ago, we had the great honor of being able to thank four members of the Omaha 54 as they shared their experiences and gave us insight into the movement that literally transformed this campus. Their panel discussion will be available on the College of Arts and Sciences YouTube channel. So to the Omaha 54 and the home Omaha Black community, as always, we salute you, we honor you, and we thank you. A discipline born of protest that called upon from the very beginning to study, analyze, and critique the continuing effects of historical enslavement, colonization, land dispossession, and corporate imperialism. We cannot but help to acknowledge that this university sits on the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom this city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. Finally, we wanna say job well done and congratulations to the newly confirmed Supreme Court Justice, the Honorable Kitanji Brown Jackson. We celebrate your historic moment, but when the celebrations are over, the real hard work begins. May the principles of Mayotte truth, justice, fairness, right dealing, always be before you and be your guide. Now it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to our two dynamic speakers. Dr. Lisa Bratton, a native of Alejo, California, is a tenured, tenured, tenured associate professor of history at Tuskegee University. She received her BBA from Howard University, her MBA, from Atlanta University and her MA and PhD degrees in African-American studies from Temple University. As a historian for the Tuskegee Airmen Oral History Project, she interviewed over 250 airmen. She has served as investigator for an oral history project on historic Brattonsville, the York County, South Carolina plantation on which her ancestors, Green and Melinda Bratton were enslaved. Her upcoming book, I Am the Forever, chronicles their lives from enslavement to being the first freedmen to own land in the county. Dr. Braddon is an avid traveler who has visited 50 states, six continents, and such fascinating places as North Korea and Cuba. In 2018, she traveled to five continents in five weeks. Dr. Bratton is an avid volunteer who loves her work at the Myrtle Beach Color School and Museum in South Carolina. Welcome, Dr. Bratton. And we also have Ms. Kandasi Chimbiri. Ms. Chimbiri is a Black History children's book author based in London. Kandasi's parents immigrated to London from Barbados in the 1960s. They were part of the large immigration of people from the Caribbean to Britain, now known as the Windrush Generation. Ms. Chimbiri was born in London and took her primary education there. 
but the family moved back to Barbados in the 1980s where she received her secondary education. She returned to England as an adult where she has established herself in public and in museum education. She has been researching, writing, and self-publishing Black history children's books for the past 13 years. In 2020, Ms. Jambiri signed a five book deal with children's book publisher, Scholastic UK. Back in December, we had a wonderful discussion with Ms. Chambiri about her latest book, The Story of Afro Hair, 5,000 Years of History, Fashion, and Styles. And that video is also available on the College of Arts and Sciences YouTube channel. So I don't wanna take up too much time because I want them both to have ample time for presentation. So I ask that each of you uh, let us know in, in, in your presentation how it is that you came to study this fantastic, fascinating topic of these Black aviators. So welcome, Dr. Bratton and Ms. Chimbiri. Thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this program. I'm very, very honored and happy to be here. So thank you very much, Ms. Hurd, and to the university for putting this program together and for honoring um, these courageous African-Americans and others who um, fought so hard to make Black studies a reality. So thank you. I am going to share my screen now. So um, to answer your question, Ms. Hurd, um, I, from 2000 to 2005, I worked as a historian for the National Park Service Tuskegee Airmen Oral History Project. It was my first job out of graduate school and when I finished my PhD. And I said to myself, you know, I can teach later. I'm going to have some fun on this job. And I actually did. It was one of the best experiences of my entire life. So um, who did we interview? We, uh, we didn't just interview the pilots. We actually cast a very wide net as it related to the definition of Tuskegee Airmen. So it's basically anyone who had any part of the experience in any way. I mean, a very wide net. So we did interview um, several pilots, uh, crew people, crew men. They generally were men. Um, women who were part of the experience as nurses and parachute packers. We interviewed civilians who worked on the base. And then um, you'll see how we, uh, how I also kind of stretched it a little bit and interviewed um, a journalist, Stanley Nelson, because he had done a piece on the Black press. And the Black press was very important during World War II. So I kind of stretched it. Plus, I just wanted to meet him. And um, so, uh, but we, we did. We cast a very wide net. We um, interviewed them, as I mentioned, from 2000 to 2005. These gentlemen were in their 70s and 80s when we interviewed them. Uh, we interviewed them in their homes. Um, people tend to feel more comfortable when they're at home. Sometimes people had mobility issues or driving challenges. So we tried to make it very easy for them by interviewing them in their homes. And we collected the interviews on mini disc, which at the time was cutting edge technology, which is now probably in a museum somewhere, but we interviewed them on audio tape um, using the mini disc. And I interviewed, I did the video interviews and I did them uh, in, we just chose selected cities. I did New York, Chicago, Atlanta, and I think I did Washington DC as well. So those were the four cities that we did the interviews, but they're mostly audio. And what do we talk about? We talked about uh, we did whole life interviews. And what does that mean? That means that we started their childhood and talk about their entire life. So the childhood was very, very interesting. There were some men and women who were born in the 1920s who had parents who had finished college. I was just very impressed by that, by people who were able to go to college in the 1900s and the late 1800s. Um, we focused on their military service um, but it's, uh, for some, and then some, um, we focused on perhaps what they did after the war, but for everyone, we talked about their entire lives. So, in, during World War II, there were two 
Army Air Corps. And I have to explain Army Air Corps because the Army and the Air Force were one unit. Now we know that there are two separate units. But at this time during World War II, they were one unit, the Army Air Corps. And there was a Black Army Air Corps and a White Army Air Corps. So top to bottom, in terms of commander all the way down, there was a Black military. And from commander all the way down, there was a white military. In the, for the Black military, um, B.O. Davis was the commander. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. We have two completely separate militaries and they didn't mix at all. So um, the, the 19, um, there's a, a report that came out in 1925 that we're gonna talk about, but this is the Army War College. And if you look and see who is making the decisions, who's advising the president, who's devising plans about war, who is um, talking about uh, human resources in war. This is the Army War College and you can see it's 100% white males, which will become relevant. When we look at the Army War College report that came out in October of 1925. So the Army, Army Air Corps decides to study how best Negroes, uh, which is what we would call, how best Negroes can be used in the military, how to use them in war. So maybe they forgot that African-Americans have served in every war this country's ever had since the very beginning, but they decide to study how best to use Negro manpower in war. And this is what they came up with. Um, all of these are taken verbatim from the 1925 Army War College report. And basically uh, their conclusion is that the Negro is inferior to the white man. Um, he takes no part in government. He failed in the World War, and they meant World War I. They didn't know a second World War was coming in 1925. He's weak in character. Um, so we know that this isn't true, but I just can't let statements like this go unchallenged. So I decided to look and see um, some Negroes who were leaders in industrial commercial life. And of course, I came up with Booker T. Washington, the first president of Tuskegee University, um, who's also the founder of National Negro Business League, which is still in operation today, as well as the founder of National Negro History Week. Uh, I'm sorry, National Negro Health Week, not History Week, Health Week. Um, and um, Maggie Lena Walker, um, who was a, um, the first woman to own a bank, not the first African-American woman, the first woman to own a bank in the United States. So if you are a lover of historic sites like I am, I welcome you to come to Tuskegee University to see the home of Booker T. Washington. It's right on the campus. It's called the Oaks. And also, if you're ever in Richmond, Virginia, go and see the home of Maggie Lena Walker. It is in downtown Richmond. And she was the first, um, she had an elevator in her home. So I don't know anybody who has an elevator in their home now, but she had an elevator in her home. She had uh, mobility challenges. So, um, so a couple of examples of the Negro takes no part in government. One of my favorite people in African-American history period is uh, Robert Smalls, who, who commandeered a Confederate ship, freed himself and his family, then began, uh, went on to become a state senator, a U.S. congressperson, the founder of a school and the editor of a newspaper, and also the um, first African-American woman uh, elected to a state legislator, Minnie Buckingham Parker Harper. So I wanted to just, um, and we know that those, um, that these uh, statements are not true, but I just cannot let them go by on challenge. So just, uh, let me take you back to 1925. So this is the environment that the Tuskegee Airmen are operating in a few years later in the early 1940s. So before I begin to tell you a little bit more about the Tuskegee Airmen, um, I, want to, I, do, I want to do a pop quiz. Um, what do these three people have in common? Dr. George Washington Carver, President Franklin Roosevelt, and Eleanor Roosevelt. Here's a little hint, FDR's wheelchair. So I don't hear anyone. So I will go on and tell you um, George Washington Carver, as you know, is esteemed scientist, probably one of the best scientists that this country or this world has ever known, was working on a polio cure. 
So Franklin Delano Roosevelt had polio, and as a result, he used a wheelchair. And so um, George Washington Carver was working, before he died in 1943, was working on a polio cure. So Eleanor Roosevelt, that's why Eleanor Roosevelt was in Tuskegee. And so she's, uh, she came to meet with George Washington Carver about the polio cure. So she looks up and she sees these planes going around. Now remember, aviation is very new at this time. It's kind of like um, space travel is now. If you meet an astronaut, you want to take a picture with him or her, and you'll be very excited about that. So that's how it was for aviation. It was very new. So she sees these planes going around the sky. She said, well, what's going on? And they said, oh, well, those are fly, you know, the, the uh, people, black people, you know, are, are, are training in aviation. So she says, I didn't think black people could fly planes. So maybe she'd heard about the 1925 Army War College report. So she said, I want to take a ride. So the Secret Service, of course, is with her. She's the sitting first lady, her husband's president at the time. And the Secret Service found a phone and called the president, tried to get him to talk her out of it. He said, I can't talk her. This is her life. This is her. She's her own person. And so she did go up in a plane, not with a cadet that sometimes, oh, I'm sorry, that sometimes people say she went up with Chief Alfred Anderson, who was one of the instructor pilots at Tuskegee, who um, taught himself to fly. Um, Chief Anderson, um, the, he couldn't find a white pilot or a, any person to teach him how to fly. So he bought a plane and taught himself to fly, which I think is beyond courageous. I wouldn't teach myself to drive a car, but um, anyway, that's Chief Anderson. So why were the Tuskegee Airmen relevant? So as I mentioned, the United States had two military, top to bottom black, top to bottom white. And in the words of the Tuskegee Airmen, we could not fail. They had a very strong um, uh, commander who was right here. Um, General Bill Davis Sr. is on the right, and he's pinning wings on his son, Bill Davis Jr., uh, who was the commander of the Tuskegee Airmen. So also the Tuskegee Airmen destroyed the myths that pro were propagated by the 1925 Army War College reports, which we've been talking about. So their success led to the desegregation of the military uh, by Executive Order 9981 in July of 1948. So some people say that the Tuskegee Airmen were the beginning of the civil rights movement because this, the army was the first organization to become integrated. So we can you know, consider them really, for so many reasons, trailblazers because they, their success also led to the desegregation of other federal and non-federal entities like employment, housing, schools, et cetera. So how the Tuskegee Airmen got started. So this is George S. Spanky Roberts, who we did not, uh, we were not able to interview as he had passed away, but he was um, also a, a second commander of the 99th Fighter Squadron when they went overseas. And this is his grandson. And so I just wanted to talk about the beginning because the grandson, hopefully, he's about a year older than that now, but the grandson may, hopefully will be a person to carry on this tradition of excellence in aviation. Um, so 1938, the civilian pilot training program was opened to, the federal government started a civilian pilot training program. What was the purpose of that? To teach civilians about aviation, but it was only open to white civilians. As remember, we're talking about aviation being very, very new. And so um, Mr. Dale White and Mr. Chauncey Spencer flew to Washington, D.C. to meet with officials to promote the cause of black um, participation in aviation. They wanted these um, aviation to be open also to blacks. And so they um, flew from Chicago to um, Washington, DC. So Mr. Spencer, there he is. I have a, an arrow pointing down to him. Um, and it was really interesting. I just enjoyed him so much. Uh, when I started at the, um, well, he had already been interviewed by another one of the historians on the project, but I happened to be reading this book called Otabanga, the Pygmy in the Zoo. And Mr. Chauncey Spencer was mentioned in that. So if you don't know much about Otabanga, he was uh, stolen or captured from his home in the Congo and he was taken around as an animal in the zoo. He's taken all over the world. He had um, chiseled his teeth into 
points because that was the tradition in his community. And that was a, a symbol of beauty or a symbol of status. And his, uh, his teeth were chiseled. And so um, he was taken around to the zoo all over the world. Anne Spencer, who was a Harlem Renaissance poet and Chauncey Spencer's mother rescued Oda Benga from the zoo. And Oda Benga came to live with Mr. Chauncey Spencer and his family. So Chauncey Spencer was a child and Oda Benga was a young adult or a, basically a grown man. But um, Mr. Spencer had uh, very strong memories about being with Oda Benga and interacting with him. And so when I saw that in this book I was reading that I bought for a dollar, I said, oh, I've got to go and interview him about Oda Benga. So I went back to Lynchburg, Virginia and spent the afternoon, a fabulous afternoon with Mr. Spencer and his wife and um, talked to him mostly about his experience with Oda Benga. And he um, autographed my book. Um, so I just had a little copy of that, but it was absolutely delightful afternoon. So as a result of Mr. White's and um, uh, Chauncey Spencer's and, and Dale Hurd as well, as a result of their efforts, the civilian pilot training program was instituted at uh, six universities. So I only have five of them here, but Tuskegee University was also one of the universities. So altogether there were six. So I have another quiz here. So why was Tuskegee chosen? I don't know, do people have audio, Deborah? I don't know if they do or not. No, they don't. Okay, all right, thank you. So, um, the reason why Tuskegee was, was chosen, two reasons. Number one, you can tell by the map um, that Tuskegee is in the South, of course, and it allows for flying pretty much year round, as opposed to a place like Washington DC where there's snow and um, weather conditions may not allow for aviation to happen all year round. And the second reason was Tuskegee is located in the South and, um, they felt that the or whites who were in, in control of this felt that they could keep those Negro pilots in line in the South, as opposed to letting them be in the North. Because remember, aviation is new. Pilots are very revered. And so that was another way to kind of keep them in line, in their place, so to speak. So I want to talk a bit about Freeman Field, Indiana. There's, there are so many Tuskegee Airmen stories. I mean, I could talk for days on this, but I do want to talk to you about Freeman Field, Indiana, where there was a, um, can't really call it a mutiny, but in some ways it is called a mutiny. So I'm going to tell this story in the words of the Tuskegee Airmen who told it to me. Um, so on, a ba on the base, there were two, as you know, there were two um, Army Air Corps, but there were also two officers clubs. And so the officers club is where the officers can go and play pool and play cards, um, watch television. Some of them had tennis courts or swimming pools, but it was the way that they got their recreation. And so these pictures I have just for, um, for comparison, really, um, but just to kind of show you how an officer's club might have looked in terms of a white officer's club and a black officer's club. So this is um, James Kennedy, one of the men that I interviewed. So um, I can just read a little bit of this. So when we got to Freeman, Freeman Field, they separated the trainees um, from the um, officers. So now all of the officers, all the Tuskegee Airmen are officers in the United States military. However, when they got to Freeman Field, they classified all the black officers as trainees and then classified the white officers as officers. So as a result, the Tuskegee Airmen officers had to use a black officers club. So they decided that um, to, to, you can't, it's during war, so you can't have a mutiny. The, the penalty for mutiny, for performing a mutiny during wartime is death. So they had to be very strategic about how they protested this. So what did they do? Um, the whites, as they would go in in small groups 
And so 15 or three would go in and then get turned away. Another seven might go in and get turned away. So James Warren, who's also the author of a book on the topic, and I have a cover of the book here. Um, he said that the white soldier at the door ordered us out of the club and arrested 19 of us and we left. And then soon as more, soon as they were arrested and um, more came in. So they had to make it appear as though it was not planned and that it just happened to be a few people going in and they get turned away and arrested. And um, they had to make it to, to look like that, like it was not a mutiny. So I interviewed Mr. Warren on January 18, 2001. And this is an excerpt from my interview with him. So uh, <laughs> Mr. Goodall, so in about a week after people going into the club and getting arrested, they had about 162 officers who were arrested. So the, um, the top brass of the military tried to get them to sign an order saying that they would not try anymore to integrate the officer's club. So of those, 61 of those men refused to sign the order. Now refusing a direct order from, a, from your superior during wartime also carries a penalty of death. But there were 61 officers who said that they would not sign. Uh, and this is Mr. Gilead, who also wrote a book on the topic, and I have his book here, a, co a copy of his book. Um, during the wartime, if you don't follow your commanding officer's direct order, you can be pub uh, punished by death. So this is Mr. Roger Terry. Uh, Mr. Terry was arrested along with the others who refused to sign the order, but he was also um, court-martialed and convicted. So court-martial is a military trial. So he was arrested and convicted of jostling an officer. So his story, I interviewed him twice. Um, after I interviewed him the first time, I just felt like I just, I, I just wanted to hear more and, and talk more in detail. So I actually interviewed him twice, absolutely wonderful person. So here's another photo of him. He was um, tried court martial and convicted of jostling an officer. Now, Mr. Terry, after he finished, he had already, was already a college graduate when he went into the military. He had a, a degree from the University of Southern California, where he's from Los Angeles. And he, uh, when he left, when he got out of the military, he went to law school, but he could not practice as a lawyer because he couldn't pass a bar exam because um, he had been convicted and he um, was, uh, what did they say about a moral interpretude or some topic, some label they had placed on him. So for all of his life, he could not practice as a lawyer. So fast forward to the 1997 Tuskegee Airmen Convention, um, Bill, uh, um, uh, Bill Clinton was there and he formally removed the charges from Mr. Terry and the other 61 officers who were um, convicted. And Mr. Terry, it, it takes him to really tell the story. Uh, he tells it a thousand times better than I can, but they called him up. When they called him up to the stage, he just was thinking to himself, what, and he used very colorful language, but I'll spare you that part. But, you know, what in the blank, blank, do these blank, blanks want with me? The blank, blank, you know, it's going on in his head. But as it turned out, it was an apology. So he called his wife up as well and said to her, you know, because she suffered too, because he was not able to have the career that he would have wanted as a lawyer. Um, so it was a very, very emotional time. Um, and it really takes him to tell the story. So I um, also included this photo of Coleman Young. Coleman Young, it seems, was the person who came up with the idea to try to integrate the officers club. We were not able to interview Coleman Young. You can see he passed away in 1997 and we didn't start until 2000. But I wanted to include his picture here because he was apparently the person who got a lot of it started. So um, we've been talking a lot about men. I did just want to say that women were also a part of the World War II experience. They um, were the, the one of the most important roles that they had was as um, sorting the mail. So just think about it. If you are um, if you are uh, overseas, you don't have a phone, you don't have the internet. So letters, that's going to be your lifeline. So African American women were very uh, involved or very uh, instrumental in, uh, among other tasks, um, working with the male. Um, I just wanted to include two women that you may have heard about, uh, Bessie Coleman and Willa Brown. 
and have another little pop quiz here. This is Herbert and Eugene, uh, uh, Herbert and uh, his wife, uh, Millicent Carter. And so the question is, who had their pilot's license first? She had hers in 1941 because she was part of the civilian pilot training program. And he got his in 1942 because he was a part of the Tuskegee Airmen Experience. Wonderful people. Um, I'm gonna conclude now because I believe I am running very, very close to my time. Um, this, this experience was so rich for me that um, this is uh, Aunt Pete Dryden and on the left of her is her husband who she met the first night she was at Tuskegee. And we became very good friends. She's my travel partner, one of my best friends. And this picture is uh, the picture I took of her. I gave her a 100th birthday party and she passed in 2020. Some of the other men that I was able to interview, uh, Tuskegee Airmen, several of them went on to have very, very illustrious careers. And this is just a small sampling of some of the other men who went on to have um, excellent careers. Um, so you've learned a little bit about Tuskegee, um, Tuskegee Airmen history. You learned a little bit about African-American history, but there's so much more to investigate and I hope that you will. Um, until, uh, Ly Sorry. until lions have their historian's tales of the hunt, shall also glo always glorify the hunter. So I'm hoping that you will um, begin to tell your own stories. Thank you very much and let's keep this history alive. Thank you, Dr. Bratton. That was that was excellent. Um, so we're going to save questions until the very end. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and, and let uh, Ms. Chambiri go ahead and present. And if you have any questions for either one, just place them in the Q&A and we'll get to them uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, lovely. Can you see my screen and can you see it in the right view? Yes, just need you to put it full screen. Full screen, okay. I think I should have done that before. Let me try. Has that worked? That's it. Lovely. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Dr. Hurd, for inviting me to talk today a little bit about the work that I'm doing. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. It's really exciting. I've really enjoyed Dr. Bratton's presentation. So some of you know me already. Some of you don't. But my name is Kandasi, and I'm a Black History children's author. And as Dr. Hurd said at the beginning, I've been writing children's books for about 13 years. I'm not a scholar, I'm not an academic, but I'm someone who feels very, very passionate about Black history and about passing these stories, this Black history, on to children. The books that I started doing tended to be more about ancient history, about ancient Africa. And in answer to Dr. Hurd's question, how did I get interested in the Black Aviators? It actually came about through a book that I wrote a few years ago called The Story of the Windrush. So the four books that you see here are books that I decided to research, write and self-publish. So I did these myself funded them myself, distributed them myself. These were all before the book deal that I decided to sign with Scholastic in 2020. The book that you see here on the right, The Story of the Windrush, was a book that I decided to write in 2017 because I tried to write books that are not only about enslavement and civil rights, what I found over the years when I would go into bookshops right here in London, and sometimes some of the biggest bookshops in Europe, is that the selection of Black history books was almost always very, very small. At most, I would see year after year about six books, and they would always be about the same topics. I thought the books were very interesting. I thought the books were well made, and I thought it was important history but I was disappointed by the scope of the books, the variety of topics. And also what I found very surprising was how is it possible that we are here, or I'm here in the UK, in London, in the center of what was an empire ruling about a quarter of the world. And yet the black history books I saw were nearly always about African-American history. 
which I'm also very interested in, but I also know that there is more. So I, I thought that was very strange. And that's what led me to begin writing these books that I do. I know there's lots of information here in the UK because I've seen it myself in museums. So although I'm not an academic, I have been for many years talking with various academics that will talk to me, working with museums, looking in galleries, trying to gather the information as much as I can and put it into the books for children and sometimes also doing tours for adults. So the scope of Black history is really, really wide. And one of the things I'm very interested in, and this is one of the things that we've spoken about as well, is not just the Black history, but the connections between Black British history, Black Caribbean history, and African-American history. And I'm gonna explain a little bit what I mean. So as I said, in 2017, I decided to write a book called The Story of the Windrush. And the reason why I decided to do that book was because the next year, which was 2018, was going to be the 70th arrival of a ship called the Empire Windrush. This is a pivotal moment in British history because it's the moment when it wasn't the first ship to bring people from the Caribbean to Britain, but it was the first one that people really started to talk about quite a bit. And although I grew up in London in the 70s, I never saw any books about it. I never saw any books about it in the 80s. I never saw any books about it in the 90s. And I never saw any books about it in the 2000s. So that's why in 2017, I thought, look, it's been 70 years. We should have a children's book about it. So that's why I decided to do this book. This is my last book, the one that Dr. Heard referred to before. So a major inspiration for the book was a gentleman called Sam King. Now, Sam King had come from Jamaica. He had served Britain during the Second World War. He worked as ground crew. He did a variety of jobs. He returned to Jamaica after the war. And then he came back in 1948 on this ship I've mentioned called the Empire Windrush. He became politically active. He actually became the first black mayor of the borough of Southwark in London, which is where I live. He also founded an organization called the Windrush Foundation. And he was very passionate about this history. Before he passed away, I heard him speak a couple of times. I went to some events that had been arranged by the Windrush Foundation and I heard him speak. I was really inspired by his story. I was really inspired by what he had achieved. However, at first, as I said, I was concentrating more on writing books about the ancient history. But then in 2017, I thought I would write and self-publish a very small book, and it is a small book. It's just um, like this, just 48 pages. And I decided to write this book telling the story of the Windrush. Unfortunately, in 2018, which was obviously the year that the book came out to commemorate the 70th anniversary, it was also the same time that a scandal happened, which we call the Windrush scandal. Um, and so that was unfortunate because it meant that many people learn about the Windrush, not the way that I would have liked them to have learned about it, about people who were pioneers like Sam King and others, but unfortunately they learned about it through a scandal. So the Windrush generation, because I know some of you are obviously, most of you actually are in the States, just in case you don't know, the Windrush generation is an umbrella term. And it's a term that we use to refer to people who came from the Caribbean to Britain, roughly around the end of the Second World War. Some were obviously here a bit before, up to about 1971. So it includes people like my parents who came in the 60s, as well as people who came earlier, like Sam King. So obviously not everyone came on the Empire Windrush ship. Not everyone actually came on ships. Some people like my parents by the 60s were coming on planes, but it refers to all of those people. And as with all definitions, historians don't always agree. So I would say there are basically three rough ways of defining it and people will argue about which one is right. 
Some people use the term to refer to all Caribbean people who came, so regardless of whether they were Black or not. And there were people who came from the Caribbean during that time who were not of African descent. The Caribbean is, of course, a multiracial, multicultural place. Some people use the term to refer only to Black people, and they also include Africans in the term because their position, which makes sense, is that although most of the people coming were from the Caribbean, there were also people who came at the same time from Africa and they received the same treatment being Black. The narrowest way to use the term is to use it to define only the people who came from the Caribbean who were of African descent. And I'm actually completely okay with that as well, because the fact is that people who came who were not of African descent did have different experiences. And it does not mean that there were not other people who, did, who came who were not of Asian Caribbean heritage, were not of European Caribbean heritage. Sam King wrote a book about his life, which I really enjoyed and obviously was one of the sources for this book. And in it, he talks about the experience of two Jamaicans, two white Jamaicans who came over also as ground crew. And he noted that they found it easier to get jobs after the war than people of African descent. So there are different ways that you can define it. And I think all three have some validity. So how did I get interested in the story of aviators? Well, as you can notice, Sam King is wearing an RAF, RAF uniform. As I said, he was ground crew. When I wrote the story of the Windrush, I was more focused on the experiences of the Caribbean, particularly the African Caribbean people who came after the war. So I wasn't so focused on his experience during the war, although I did mention it. However, in the book on page 41, let me see if I can actually show it to you. I hope it's not gonna to be too small on your screen. There is a picture that was taken on the Windrush when it arrived. And I chose the picture for the book because it had Sam King in it. You can see it. So Sam King is in this picture and the picture is taken in 1948 when the Empire Windrush arrives in the UK. The people, the men in this picture are men who were in the RAF like Sam King. And they're being spoken to by people who worked for the RAF at the time. And there's a man next to them whose name was Johnny Smythe, who was the officer on board the Windrush when it went out and came back. So it actually took people from Britain to the Caribbean, and then it brought back people like Sam King. And I began thinking about it more and more, and I was fascinated by that photo. And that's where I really got the idea about starting to look a little bit more into the experiences of the Caribbean and African RAF airmen during the Second World War. It's been a steep learning curve for me because obviously I've not had the, the experience of interviewing all these people or working in an institution, but it has been really interesting to look into it. What I found is that although we focus very much on the Second World War, the history of Britain's black airmen actually begins far sooner. Now, if you were to Google Britain's first black pilot, you would see a name come up of a gentleman called William Robinson Clark or Robbie Clark from Jamaica. However, it's actually been recently identified that there is an earlier pilot I'm not going to tell you his name. I'm not going to show you any pictures yet, but I'm just going to put some of this information out there. So there is a gentleman. And what's interesting about this gentleman is that he was born in Britain. He was mixed race black and he actually became a pilot two years before Robbie Clark. So he becomes a pilot in 1915. But Robbie Clark is still Britain's first black combat pilot. 
because this gentleman's route is slightly different. His role is slightly different. He's more on the technical side. He can fly six different planes, and that's these biplanes at that time. And obviously this is during the First World War, although he was a pilot or he was joining the Royal Flying Corps before the World, First World War. So he actually has a career very early. So it's a really interesting story, not only because he's a very early pilot, very early black pilot, probably one of the second or third in history, but he also becomes a commissioned officer. And this is at a time when, because of the class system in the UK, usually people who are commissioned officers come from the upper classes. And he's not coming from the upper classes, and he's also black and you're not supposed to be black and be a commissioned officer. So a really interesting story that I'm looking forward to, you know, revealing a little bit more also in time. Robbie Clark then comes from Jamaica a couple years later after the First World War starts. He makes his own way by ship to the UK. He doesn't come alone, there are others coming as well, but he comes. And in Jamaica, he was a chauffeur, probably for a white family. So he has skills that are very rare at that time because being a chauffeur, you also, he also understood engines and he could fix car engines. And he comes with letters from many of the professional men in Kingston, in Jamaica. And he comes to the UK and he goes straight to the Royal Flying Corps, which as I said, is the predecessor of the Royal Air Force. And he goes and he asks to join and he's accepted. And he goes out to France during the First World War, where he's working as a driver more, but then he decides he wants to fly and he's sent back and he learns to fly and he does become a pilot. He serves during the First World War, he's injured. And eventually after the war, he goes back to Jamaica. Unfortunately, although he is almost certainly the first black Caribbean combat pilot, his story is not well known in the Caribbean, including Jamaica. I certainly didn't know anything about him when I was growing up or doing my secondary education in Barbados. So he becomes a pilot, sergeant pilot, so he doesn't become commissioned, but it's still a, a huge achievement because even at that time, again, because of the class system, it's quite rare to have a pilot who isn't a commissioned officer. Pilots and ob observers usually, again, tend to come from the upper classes and they tend to be commissioned officers. So two really interesting stories there, tale of two interesting men quite early. When the First World War comes to an end, now obviously there's less need for planes, for air crew and for ground crew. So there's less opportunities for you know, Britons black airmen, whether in Britain or in the colonies, to have the opportunity to fly. So you find now that the opportunity has shrinked. Interestingly, and this is one of the things that I was talking about before with Dr. Bratton and Dr. Hurd, interestingly, the stories that I am finding of men who become airmen or become aviators, they're coming from the Caribbean and going to either Canada or the US to learn to fly. So you have people like Hubert Julian, who comes from Trinidad. He learns to fly, he said, in Canada, and he then becomes a part of African-American history. And he sometimes flew with Bessie Coleman, whose photo uh, Dr. Bratton showed earlier. And Bessie Coleman, obviously, is an inspirational aviator. She's an African-American woman, and she's getting her license two years before Amelia Earhart is better known. So, you know, so what they're doing is still amazing. Another one of the black, well, really black British, because they're coming from the British Empire. Another one who I find extremely interesting is Dr. Albert Forsyth, who comes from Jamaica. The family come from Bahamas originally, but he comes from Jamaica. And it's interesting because here, you can see a picture of him. He's here with Charles Alfred Anderson, who Dr. Bratton showed. He was the man, Chief Anderson, as you refer to him, who took Eleanor Roosevelt up in the plane. So Albert Forsyth, he comes from Jamaica. He comes to Tuskegee. He, as a young man, he's, his father sent him to do studies. He studies at the Tuskegee 
school. He meets the headmaster at the time, Booker T. Washington, very influenced by him. He has really interesting experiences, really interesting things to say about the differences between being in a black majority country and a black minority country. So people of African descent are second class citizens in both, but there are differences between the Caribbean experience and obviously the African American experience. Really interesting. Despite everything, he decides to stay in the States, it takes him a long time, he becomes a medical school doctor, and eventually he meets with, if you can see here, Charles Alfred Anderson. And the two of them overcome many obstacles together to become the Goodwill Flyers in 1934. And they do this famous flight that flies around parts of the Caribbean from the United States to the Caribbean and South America, as is mentioned here. And part of their reason is to promote racial equality. Part of their reason is also to show that black men can fly, to show what black aviators can do. So lots of interesting links with the history. Interestingly, as you can see on this website here, it says that he was a physician from Atlantic City, New Jersey. He was a physician from Atlantic City, New Jersey, but he actually came from Jamaica. And so this is what I also find interesting, how especially during this period, we find the, the history becomes not so well known in Britain, but becomes part of the African-American history. So yeah, I just found that really, really interesting. So that's between the war years. Then obviously we get to the Second World War, which is when you have now the majority of black British airmen. World War II starts about 1940. Hitler and the Germans have overrun most of Western Europe. 1940, France has fallen and Britain is now the next place in Hitler's sights. In order to conquer Britain, they first of all need to um, own the skies. They need to defeat the RAF. And they do that obviously, or try to do that obviously using the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. The Battle of Britain takes place Really important point in um, British history. 3,000 men from the RAF defend Britain against the Luftwaffe. There is a little bit of confusion, I think, creeping in because some people I have seen started to say that they were black men during the Battle of Britain or black men who were flying during the Battle of Britain. They weren't black men because after the First World War, despite the achievements of people like Robbie Clark and the other gentlemen that I mentioned, the color bar is still reimposed. So at this time, people, men who are of African descent, who are not of pure European descent, are being turned away. There is a man called Sidney Kennard who came from British Guyana as soon as the First World War started to volunteer. And he was turned away on the basis of color. So at this time, or just at the start of the Second World War, men of African descent are not supposed to be accepted. However, from November 1940, which is interesting, just after the fall, or just after the, the Battle of Britain, not the fall, because the fall of France already happened. The Battle of Britain has been won, just. And now, interestingly, it's being relaxed. The colour bar has been relaxed. So men have started to arrive from the Caribbean. Some are being accepted, but they don't start to fly right away. So the 3,000 men that fly in the Battle of Britain are white men. They're not any of them that are of known African ancestry. They are mainly British, and British meaning not necessarily that they were all born in Britain. And I think this is where, again, some of the confusion comes because of perhaps we don't learn enough about the empire. So some of those British men will have been born in places like Palestine and India, but it doesn't mean that they were Indian and Palestinians. They're British. They just happen to be born there because their parents would have been there as part of the empire. We also have white men who are coming from the occupied territories, so places like Poland and some of the other countries that the Nazis have overrun. You also have white men who are coming from the US, a small number, 
although the US hasn't joined the war yet, there are some Americans as well. And I think there might also have been one Irish man, a couple of Irish as well. Where I think some of the confusion is coming is that then you have the groups I would call sort of people from the white British, the, the colonials, the white colonials. So some of those men are Australian, they're New Zealanders, they're Canadians. They're people who have um, ties to the old country, the mother country. When you look at their POW um, records, some of them have family, even though they're Canadians, even though they're Australians, even though they're New Zealanders, some of them have family in the UK. So that's their old country, the mother country. Then you have other colonials who are coming from Africa and the Caribbean. So you have people who are white South Africans, white Rhodesians, and you also have white Caribbeans. And this is where I think the confusion comes because many people, I think, confuse sometimes nationality with color and race. Barbadian is not a race. Yes, most Barbadians look like me, but there are white Barbadians. And at this time, the Barbadians that are in, or the one Barbadian that is in the Battle of Britain, or Innes, is a white Barbadian. The Jamaican, whether it's one or two, I don't remember, but the ones that are in the Battle of Britain, they are white Jamaicans. So these are nationalities, they're not races or colours, and not at this time. However, from November 1940, the RAF begins to more actively recruit men of all backgrounds. And so this is where you now get the black RAF rec recruits coming and you get people like you can see here, Arthur O. Weeks from Barbados and also Sergeant Collins. And these are Spitfire pilots. And different from the US, they're not serving in segregated units. They are integrated. So they serve alongside and in the same planes or the same units, obviously these are Spitfire pilots, but in the bombers, they will be in mixed groups. Arthur Oweeks is interesting because he's one of the men who comes over during what is called the second contingent. And the timing is interesting. In July, 1940, which is before the active recruitment starts of non-white men, in July, Barbados sends a group of men called the First Contingent. They're all white Barbadian men, and they're coming to join all parts of the armed forces. Then in November 1940, they send the Second Contingent, and this group consists of men, 50% are black, 50% are white, and they're coming only to join the RAF. The RAF is accepting recruits who are of other backgrounds, whereas the Navy and the Army are not as accepting. And this is why you find that most of the men who served Britain during the Second World War served in the RAF. So Arthur Weeks, he comes in that second contingent. He becomes a Spitfire pilot. We also have Errol Barrow in that second contingent. He serves as a navigator, and he later goes on to become the first prime minister of independent Barbados in 1966. These men, after serving with Britain in the RAF, many of them, and I, I'm not going to go into listing it now because there's just not enough time, but these men, many of them go on then to make contributions. Like Errol Barrow, you have people like Lincoln Lynch, who was an air gunner, he becomes a commissioned officer, and after the war, he goes to the States and he becomes the chairman of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. They are, they, they play roles, but it's tracing the history to different countries. Some of them contribute to the civil rights in Britain. Some of them contribute to civil rights in the States and some of them contribute to civil rights and independence movements in other countries in Africa and the Caribbean. And it's these sort of connections and these stories, the global nature that I find really, really interesting. Let's check, I think I might be okay for time. This is a picture that is sometimes used um, to say that they were black men who fought in the Battle of Britain. I think the confusion is because the gentleman here, Vincent Bunting, he did arrive during that time, but he didn't start yet um, flying. 
the gentleman he's talking to is a guy called Sailor Malan, who is one of those white um, colonials. He's coming from South Africa and he fights and he flew during the Battle of Britain. So perhaps that's also where some of the confusion might be coming. This is an interesting picture that you probably see quite a bit. This is on a fantastic website, Caribbean Air Crew hyphen ww2.com, which is an archive trying to record the details of all the air crew that came from the Caribbean. And it records all of the air crew, whether or not they were black. So there will be people on there of all different backgrounds. And in many cases, only names are known. So it's an archive that's definitely worth looking at. And if you can spread the word and also help to contribute and build up the information on it. Obviously, despite the fact that the, um, the men coming would have been serving not in segregated units or segregated squadrons or segregated, segregated RAF, there obviously were the attitudes of the time. There was a color bar in Britain so there would have been places that they would have gone and they wouldn't be accepted. Many of them do speak quite well of their experiences overall, but there are obviously going to be issues as you would expect at that time. Some of the air crew also had problems later on in the war when America joined and American servicemen, not Air Force necessarily, but American servicemen are now being based in Britain. This is a story of a gentleman called Arthur Waldron, Walrut. He came from Barbados and he was at a dance. He asked a white lady to dance with him. She wanted to dance with him. And a white American serviceman wasn't very happy about it. And there was a fight. The next day he was killed in action. So there are all these experiences that the black British airmen are having the same as Everyone else, they're being killed in action. Some are being imprisoned when they're being shot down, which is something else we're going to talk about in a bit. But they also have to deal with racism and they also have to deal with being far away from home and maybe not having some of the, um, perhaps some of the more welcoming experiences that are sometimes afforded to the white airmen. So I also thought that was worth mentioning. There is now, since 2017, a memorial to commemorate the contributions of African and Caribbean airmen, people, not just airmen actually, but people who served in the First World War and Second World War. And it's interesting for me that it's in Windrush Square in Brixton. In many ways, Windrush Square and Brixton is associated with the Windrush generation and it's often seen a little bit as a home, spiritual home of modern Black Britain and a large part of that was due to an ex-RAF man, he was a policeman during the war, RAF policeman called Baron Baker and when the men came over on the Windrush ship, he was there to meet the ship even though there were only a small contingent, maybe about 50 men on it who were ex-RAF. And he went to meet them and he was influential in helping to find places for them and to help that first generation to settle in the UK. From their experience in the RAF, they learned discipline and they also learned about the world. They met other people of African descent from other territories and they also met African Americans and I think it's some of these experiences that influenced them to go on to do some of the things that they did. There are some interesting websites and there's two that I've mentioned here. There's a blog, Pilots of the Caribbean, which was based on an exhibition that took place at the RF Museum, I think it was in 2014. There's also the Caribbean Air Crew website that I've mentioned, which has lots of useful information as well. And these are my details if you want to connect with me or follow me and look out for information about my forthcoming book. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Kandasi. That was that was great. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, does anyone have any thing from the audience? Uh, let's see. Solange Ashby typed, unbeknownst to me, a Tuskegee Airman was my neighbor in Bethesda, Maryland. He passed recently at the age of 102. Yeah, that was probably Charles McGee, who, um, if you're a football fan, he tossed out a ball at, or maybe it was a baseball game, not much of a sports fan, but very recently he, uh, well, before he passed away, he tossed out a ball at a very important sports game. And um, he was also the president, the former president of the Tuskegee Airmen um, National Organization. So, um, and this, I, I didn't mention this, but, you know, there is a national organization. So I was able to really stay in contact with the Tuskegee Airmen from uh, going to every national convention um, uh, since I started working with them. And I'm also, I was also on the board of the Tuskegee Airmen National Organization, and now I'm on the board of the Scholarship Foundation. So I still do, you know, it's the job that keeps on giving. I still maintain very close contact with them. But yeah, he will be missed. Uh, one thing that I found interesting in um, uh, Kandasi when you were doing your presentation was the um, that article that you have from the Smithsonian that had the picture with uh, Dr. Forsyth and uh, Alfred Anderson. Yeah. And what I noticed was that they just totally dismissed him as an aviator. They were yeah. saying his contribution was financial. And yeah. it's like, wow, he was a Black aviator as well during World War II from the other side. So they both were, uh, you know, yeah. equally, uh, should have been equally celebrated, you know. But I just thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah. And it was interesting that he was, you know, there wasn't really a lot said about him. And I can understand, obviously, that, you know, Dr. Anderson went on and played a role with the Tuskegee Airmen. So that was pivotal. But this is why I said I find it interesting about the different nationalities coming together. And yeah, I do believe that Dr. Forsyth did contribute more money. But it's actually him working with Anderson. They're working together in the beginning to pull off this Goodwill flyer um, trip tour around the Caribbean in 1934, which is really amazing, you know. So yeah, so that's I, I, this is the sort of thing that I think we should look more at and look more at these these stories and these connections as well, and some of the less well known facts. So we have a few questions in the Q and A. Um, first, uh, Ricky McCarthy. Are there any interviews or videos with RAF WW2 Caribbean pilots? There are, and there's even a recording of Robbie Clark as far, you know, uh, even from the, the, well, not from the First World War, obviously later on, because he actually lived till the 1980s. But for me, one of the reasons why I want to do this book, and I, and I hope that it will be well received, is because when I look at, you know, Dr. Pratton, Pratt, sorry, Dr. Pratton's presentation, I see you know, the amount of work that you've done with the Tuskegee Airmen and everything that is available. I don't see that we have that same volume over here. You know, I think that there could be a lot more done about the Caribbean RAF men, including the ones of African descent. I think we have a lot more work to do. So there are books. I mean, Cy Grant, he wrote a book about his experience in the RAF. He wrote this, I think, in I think 2008, I think, this is a good book. He was, um, this is the gentleman that we were talking about last week when I was saying that he was the only black prisoner of war in the camp in Stalaglof three. And I couldn't understand it at first. And then I realized that he was moved to another camp when some of the Tuskegee Airmen were shot down and were in the camp. So that's why he didn't see them. So he's hey, written can a you, book. Can you can you talk about that? Because you, you didn't really talk about, and I, and I think that's an important uh, thing to talk yeah, we, about. Yeah, we were talking about that because Dr. Panay was saying to you that I didn't know for sure if it was 30 or 31 or 32 Tuskegee Airmen that had been POWs and what their experience were like. Because what I find interesting is, like I said, with the RAF men, they are integrated. So they're going to be in bombers. Cy Grant is a black navigator. 
He's in a bomber. The other six men are white Canadians and Englishmen. No one is serving in, you know, they're not like the Tuskegee men, they're not serving all in segregated uh, planes. When the Tuskegee men get shot down, the Germans are putting them in the camps with the white Americans. So this is why I was asking you, you know, what did they say about those experiences? Because I just thought that was just, that just kind of blew my mind, really. But, but can you tell our audience uh, what his experience was? Because I don't think that- Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. No, his experience was uh, fine. All the thousands of men was fine, including white American men, absolutely fine. He did have one, there was one man though, who did uh, call him the N-word and couldn't understand how he could be an officer. Because obviously this is a camp for officers because they obviously put in the officers in separate, you know, uh, separate camps from the non-officer airmen. And um, and that was apparently a, a one white American man from the South. And he spoke about that. But other than that, South Africans, every other nationality, all white men, there wasn't any problem. So in a POW camp, Germans that are holding <laughs> their enemies hostage they're placing black men, RAF Tuskegee Airmen, in officers' quarters. Yeah, where they where they hold all the officers, whether they're regardless of color, and they're yeah. treated well. Oh yeah, yeah, oh uh, yeah. These camps yeah. are not like the not like the you know. The, I mean, Germans probably had like forty thousand camps. They've had they have so many different types of camps. So these uh, camps for the airmen, yeah, the officers are treated well. The guy that I mentioned that was on the Windrush, Johnny Smythe, who was the officer in charge, he also was in a prison camp. He was in Stalaglyph 1. Again, you know, treated fine. Yeah. I do want to Where add the to issues were, may have been the Jewish. Some of the Jewish officers, however, would have had a different treatment if they were discovered to be Jewish. Yeah. I did also want to add um, that the Tuskegee Airmen shared that this was one of the first times that they really felt like officers when they were behind enemy lines in the prisoner of war camp. The three that I interviewed that uh, had wildly different experiences, it was almost like it was, they were in three different wars. One was shot down and was in a hospital most of the time and the Germans did all they could to try to save his leg. Um, the other, the second one, um, spent the entire war scavenging for food. He came back to the United States, he was under 100 pounds. And um, that was his entire experience was trying to eat for months. And then the third one, I thought he was on vacation. The way he described his experiences actually sounded kind of fun. So I, I don't know, it was just three very, very different experiences, but what they had in common was that they were treated like men and like officers, unlike in the United States, where they're treated like second-class citizens. All right, um, there is a question in the chat. How was the involvement of the Tuskegee Airmen in the civil rights movement after the war? Did they continue to fight for civil rights in the military after World War II, or did they protest in the different marches? Okay, it varied widely, widely, widely. So the uh, the men who stayed in the service after the Tuskegee Airmen experience, so remember the, the uh, military is now integrated. And so they would be the only one at this base, the only one at that base, be a couple of us at this base, because they were sent all over the world. And so their experiences vary widely. Some of them did participate in the civil rights movement, in terms of protesting, some a lot of them had families and went to work to provide for their families, um, but their experience were, were, were very diverse. The ones that I did highlight, um, for example, Percy Sutton, who became, you know, is Malcolm X's lawyer, and uh, but they had very, very, it's really hard to say because we, we interviewed 800, but there were a total of 10,000 people involved in the Tuskegee Airmen experience. We have a gentleman who was um, a member of the Atlanta chapter, Mr. Ted Johnson, spent decades 
um, creating a database of all the men and women who were involved in the experience. And if you click on their name, it goes right to a document that proves that they were part of the experience. And so there are 10,000 people um, involved in the Tuskegee Airman Experience uh, in civilian arena and military as well. All right, um, there's a comment in the chat. Robbins, Illinois has a small museum devoted to the Tuskegee Airmen who got their start at what was the Robbins Airport. Okay, um, I just make one comment about that. Um, uh, and I appreciate that. I didn't know about that one. There are a lot of um, Tuskegee Airmen archives and, you know, in different cities. We are starting one at Tuskegee with the help of the heritage members. And the heritage members are the sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, et cetera, of the Tuskegee Airmen, because they're the ones that are going to have to continue this history. So in conjunction with Tuskegee University and the heritage members of the, um, uh, the heritage group, we are going to um, start an archive at Tuskegee University. So they'll be donating um, items that belong to their parents, and they will be, be able to come to Tuskegee University and see those. So we're really excited about that project. All right, so uh, before we uh, conclude, there are a couple of people that I want to bring into the conversation. Um, so here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, we actually have um, an aviation institute. And so we have uh, people who are instructors uh, for that. So I'm raising them to panelists. All right, so Mr. Taylor and Mr. Johnson, if you could turn on your cameras, our audience can see you. All right, hello, hello, how are you? Good morning, how are you all? All right. Good morning, how's morning. everybody? All right, so I just wanted to invite uh, Theodore and Eric to give us some words about um, their work their interest in aviation, how they got started, and anything that they might want to contribute or, or comment about the, the presentations. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to you two and let you go ahead and speak. You two, you want to open the floor? Sure. Um, well, uh, th thank you both. That was uh, some really great uh, information, um, especially hearing about what was going on in the UK. Um, obviously, we don't know as much about that. Um, as, as maybe we should uh, with, the, with our shared histories. But, um, you know, I, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to be in these, these types of events. Um, you know, my, my uh, interest in aviation was really just from, from being a small child uh, and wanting to be a, a military pilot. And uh, I ended up, you know, joining the Navy, being a Navy helicopter pilot. And um, I'm just uh, glad that I'm able to continue to serve uh, in the aviation community. Um, you know, at UNO, I, I think that uh, I think it's uh, not not lost on me that we are in a very non diverse industry, and yet our department is very diverse. Um, and even um, it's not true now, but when I first got here, both chief pilots at the airports that we use were both black guys. Um, and again, that's that's rare. Um, and yet we have not a single black female pilot in the entire state. And that's something that um, I'm really passionate about working on. Um, I'm on the board of Girls Inc. I'm on the board of the Aviation STEM Day organization. Um, you know, uh, Theodore and I just started the uh, OBAP chapter uh, for our university and we're sitting down with the local chapter president of the Tuskegee chapter here because we want to try to get that reinvigorated. I um, mean, we really just want to work on doing what we can do to increase the diversity of the aviation community and it's just uh it's work that just uh, has to continue um and has to continue uh, uh it is you know it's interesting you talk about the, the the tuskegee database i've always had this um family lore that one of our family members was a tuskegee airman but i've nobody ever really had the the name and i was thinking that Maybe is now the time for me to do a little more research and find out if, if there is a, a relative in our in our uh, in our family tree that 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 was there. So I need to need to pull that string. So, but anyway, uh, Theodore, I'll I'll leave it to you. Appreciate it, Et. Uh, thank you both for the wonderful presentations. I know I learned a lot 
um, and, and plan to leverage some of the information in my diversity and aviation class that I teach uh, every summer and usually every fall. And we'll be contacting both of you to potentially uh, speak in that class as well, because the students can definitely learn uh, from the information provided today. Uh, I'm an instructor alongside ET at the AI at, at UNO. I've been there for about two years, originally from Detroit, Michigan, uh, where I, I got my master's and uh, my undergrad in aviation. Um, interest in aviation started as a kid, you know, took a flight with my mom when I was younger and was infatuated ever since. I decided to pursue it in, in college. Uh, originally was pre-med, but then made the decision to switch and I uh, haven't looked back since. Um, now I'm, I'm getting my doctorate in public administration, so I've been able to meld my passions for aviation and public administration to really focus on policy and advocacy for minorities to increase our participation, because as ET alluded to, it's very low, um, you know, 3.5%, and that's a conservative number. And, you know, we're actually working to try and change that uh, on our campus and in the community, uh, largely through OBAP and just reinvigorating some stuff. So exposure is key. And we're trying to meet students and families where they're at because it's a very viable industry and field. Um, we just have to get them uh, that exposure and, and the resources that they need. So that's that's what we're currently embarking on. And uh, you know, I'm very excited from from listening to the two of you today, and uh, even more excited to be able to share you know our information uh, with, with people who may not know where to start. So I say that in terms of attendees, you know, if, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. We would love to be of assistance and help you get started. Thank you. Thank you for both of, uh, both of you. Uh, and if you could, if you could uh, put your information in the, the chat, especially about OBAP, uh, so that people will know if, in case they have some students that might be interested. Because we really, I mean, um, the fact that there are no black female pilots in the whole state, uh, that's something that I would, I would love for you all to recruit and train that first black female pilot. <laughs> so yeah, so thank you so much. Um, there were a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, I think you took care of one of them, uh, Lisa. Um, the other one is many African-Americans came to Britain over the years. Frederick Douglass is perhaps the most famous example. Some research has been done about these visitors in the UK and perhaps this UK information is not so well known in the US. Hence the need for more cooperation between to discuss this shared history. So yes, definitely, definitely. All right, so I want to thank all of you uh, for being here today. Before we leave, I'd let, like to let you know about our next event. Uh, on Tuesday, we will have Dr. Jasmine Watkins, who is an instructor here in the Black Studies Department, speaking on self-advocacy in mathematics, sources of math confidence among Black college freshmen. So she will be sharing her research that she did uh, studying uh, Black college freshmen and their perceptions of uh, their self-confidence and looking at the factors that um, kind of uh, predictors for that. So that will be very interesting. But again, thank you, uh, Dr. Bratton. Thank you, Ms. Chambiri, for presenting for us today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Taylor for your comments. And again, thank all of our audience members for being here and sharing with us today and celebrating Black Studies 50th anniversary. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, I enjoyed it very much.